fallen officers. Two of New York's finest are gunned down without warning in their cruiser. Strengthening faith. New York Catholics come together to define their identity in today's changing culture. Christmas message. Pope Francis reminds Vatican cardinals about their mission in the church. And special delivery. Why one town's postmark is in high demand this time of year. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, December 22nd, 2014. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Suzanne LaFranchi in for Brian Patrick looking at your news now. The mayor of New York City is asking people everywhere to put aside protests and political debates tonight. Instead, he says the focus should be on the families of the two police officers shot dead inside their patrol car this weekend. Wyatt Goolsby joins us from the National Law Enforcement Officer Memorial here in Washington with more. Wyatt. Suzanne, over the next few days as we learn more about this case, officers in New York and across the country are being asked to take extra caution and to wear their bulletproof vests. Right now, New York's mayor is also asking for everyone to take a more respectful tone, saying that the families of the two police officers killed, quote, are now our family and we will stand by them. The attack on them was an attack on all of us. It was an attack on our democracy. It was an attack on our values. It was an attack on every single New Yorker and we have to see it as such. During a police charity luncheon today, New York's mayor gave credit to law enforcement. It comes as Bill de Blasio is facing criticism from some who say he hasn't done enough to protect police and even incited violence against them. Officers Winjin Liu and Rafael Ramos were ambushed Saturday afternoon by a 28-year-old who posted online that he would put wings on pigs. The suspect, Ismael Brinsley, also shot himself soon after. The killing Saturday come as police nationwide have been in the spotlight. Officers have been criticized following Eric Gardner's death in a chokehold and Michael Brown's death in a shooting. Protests, some racially charged, erupted weeks after grand juries declined to charge the officers involved. Both New York's mayor and police commissioner listened to Cardinal Timothy Dolan in St. Patrick's Cathedral Sunday. We worry about a city Dolan called for prayers and for reflection following what he called brutal murders. Craig Floyd with the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund in Washington says he was sickened when he heard about the officers' deaths. His nonprofit is tracking an increase in law enforcement deaths nationwide from last year and says officers killed by firearms are up 60 percent. Floyd says discussion of events have turned to hateful rhetoric, which he hopes can be reversed. We have to realize that words do matter. Uh, and that sometimes weak-minded individuals are easily influenced by the words they hear. There are some who are influenced by those words, and sometimes they do bad things as a result. Thank you, Wyatt. Both the New York mayor and the police commissioner are also met with families of the police officers earlier today. In a late afternoon press conference, police also asked the public for help and any details they may have of Brinsley's final hours. Suzanne. Thank you, Wyatt. A police officer in Milwaukee who shot and killed a mentally ill black man in April will not face criminal charges. A county prosecutor says Officer Christopher Manny shot Dontre Hamilton in self-defense during the incident. Police say Hamilton resisted being frisked and grabbed Manny's police baton, after which the officer opened fire, shooting Hamilton 14 times. The county's prosecutor said the investigation included searching for any video of the incident. The death of Dontre Hamilton is a tragedy for everyone involved. My decision today that criminal charges will not be issued against Officer Manny does not depreciate the very legitimate concerns raised any time a law enforcement officer uses deadly force against a citizen. Hamilton's family says they'll ask for a federal investigation in the case. They also ask for people not to turn to violence if they're upset by today's decision. Manny is at least the third white police officer not to be charged in the past month after a confrontation that led to a black man's death. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering on today's world. The Pope asked heads of Vatican's departments and other senior leaders to examine their consciences in order to better serve the church. Addressing the Curia for Christmas, Francis identified 15 spiritual illnesses that can sometimes infect church leaders. He warned against rivalry, gossip, and spiritual hardening. 
The Pope reminded the bishops and cardinals they are called to always improve and grow in communion, holiness and wisdom to fully carry out their mission. From his meeting with the Curia, the Pope went to meet with Vatican employees. He talked to gardeners, ushers and secretaries about caring for their spiritual lives and families. He even talked about cleaning up their speech. The Pope encouraged Vatican employees to care for their work, carrying out their duties with humility and forgiveness towards co-workers. A federal judge in Washington heard arguments against President Obama's immigration plans brought by a border state sheriff. Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio filed the lawsuit in federal court. The sheriff argues the president's actions will let more illegal immigrants into the country, burdening police because of more crime. The federal judge repeatedly questioned if Arpaio has legal standing to bring the case, saying Congress might be a better forum to resolve the issue. A government lawyer called the case a political dispute that should be dismissed. A ruling is expected soon. North Korea is refusing to attend a U.N. Security Council meeting here, where the country's human rights situation will be discussed for the first time. In the boldest effort to confront the communist nation, the council is referring North Korea to the International Criminal Court. A recent UN-backed inquiry alleged several abuses within North Korea, including starvation and a harsh political prison camp system. North Korea accuses the U.S. and allies of using the human rights issue as a weapon to overthrow leadership in the nuclear-armed nation. North Korea is also accused of hacking Sony Pictures, and now former employees are suing the company over the alleged hack. The suits argue Sony is negligent because it didn't prepare for the massive cyber breach, allowing workers' private financial and personal information to be exploited. The FBI says the communist country conducted the attack, causing Sony to stop release of the movie The Interview, which focuses on North Korea dictator Kim Jong-un. A senior Cuban official says Cuba is open to all of President Barack Obama's plans to improve relations between the two countries. The head of Cuba's North American Affairs says the island nation welcomes the entire package from the U.S. This includes U.S. equipment to improve Cuba's Internet and potentially unlimited exports to Cuba's new class of private business owners. The Cuban government has historically imposed heavy regulations on both the Internet and businesses. This is being called the most significant changes in relations with Cuba in 54 years. Famed British singer Joe Cocker has died. Cocker died early this morning in Colorado, where he's been living for the last two decades. The singer was known for several songs, including his own version of the Beatles hit with a little help from my friends in the 70s. Cocker recorded a top 10 hit, You Are So Beautiful. Joe Cocker was 70. Coming up, we speak with the Catholic group Caritas about their relief efforts following catastrophes in the Philippines, Iraq, and West Africa this year. I'm Archbishop Joseph Kurtz, the Archbishop of Louisville and the President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And I want to wish all of you viewers of EWTN a very blessed Christmas uh, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. May Christ come more deeply into your hearts and into the hearts of your family. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Suzanne LaFranchi. To everyone who gets caught up in worrying, Pope Francis reminds us the Christmas season is about hearing from Jesus knocking on the door. That's what he told the faithful who attended his Sunday Angelus this weekend just ahead of Christmas. He said, just as God sent an angel to Mary asking for her to say yes, God invites us to put ourselves at his disposal. Francis said, when we get caught up in our concerns, we must stop and pray so that Jesus' coming doesn't pass as we celebrate his birth. Inspired by their Catholic faith, the group Caritas Internacionalis provides grassroots relief for disasters in nearly every country worldwide. Our Rome correspondent, Alan Holdren, has more. Mr. Roy, the UN exists, the World Food Program and other international relief organizations exist. Uh, what makes Caritas different? 
Oh, the UN is the community of nations. It, it has a top-down approach. Caritas is exactly the contrary. It is a platform for member organizations starting from parish level, diocesan level, national level to come together and work together at the international level. So when uh, there is a major crisis somewhere, the WFP, World Food Programme, may come in, but they will very often use the Caritas network to be able to bring the food which is necessary to, to the victims. And um, so there is a strong relationship there. It is complementary. Okay. And in places like uh, Syria and Iraq right now, Caritas is very active in helping people to prepare for the winter as they face crisis, the refugees. Uh, you've helped more than 30,000 families to have safe housing. What is your goal throughout the winter for these people? Well, as, uh, as you might think, no, is to protect. So it's a global work of protection all the time, especially in northern Iraq. The situation remains dire, as well as in Syria. Displaced people are more and more. And, uh, but during the winter time, uh, uh, you know, their situation is even worse because of the cold. Um, and it might be very cold in these regions. So what we call winterization programs with blankets, uh, renewal of shelters, food, this is going on. And, and uh, what I must say is that the situation uh, in both countries, maybe even more in Syria, is really dire. It's, it's a tragedy which is going on and on with more and more people suffering. Millions of displaced, millions of refugees in the neighboring countries that are kind of not able to cope anymore with it because it's too much, really too much. And uh, so uh, we do have to come in and we do come in and other organizations in the church come in, but it is far from what is necessary. World Food Program, because of uh, lack of funds, has stopped uh, helping for the month of December. Uh, so the situation is, is, is very difficult and uh, again, the international community must look for a, a, for a solution, which has to be a political solution to these wars. It cannot go on as it is, because so many millions of people who two, three years ago were living peacefully are now just uh, downtrodden. It's yeah, terrible. There, there you're dealing with man-made disaster. Uh, you, you also, in uh, places like the Philippines, deal with, with natural disasters. Uh, the, the two typhoons in the last year and also uh, an earthquake. There, what is your goal and, and how is it being received? So always our goal will be to help people in the first place survive when the disaster strikes and then to uh, rebuild their lives. And uh, this is only possible through the communities. So our focus target always is to have organized communities. And in places like the Philippines, which as you just said, have you know, two, three major disasters a year, communities have to be organized and this is a big, uh, a big um, action uh, for the church, organized communities and these communities are not just a village or uh, city, city areas, it's uh, basic Christian communities so built on, uh, built on their faith and whatever organization comes in will find organized communities able to, able to face uh, the issue. In, uh, in a place also like West Africa, where Caritas has been very, very active, in addition to all of the, uh, the tragedy that is imaginable there, there's also, uh, you're working with West African orphans now. Uh, these orphans, how, how are they doing right now? What is Caritas doing to help them? Mm. In, in West Africa, like in most countries in Africa, there is a very strong uh, sense of solidarity and based on um, uh, white family. So when both parents uh, die of Ebola in that case uh, and, and the children survive, they will be taken care of by neighbors, by, by cousins, by aunts or uncles. And this is fundamental. <laughs> To, to help them survive and, and, and look okay. at the future in a different way. But these communities are so poor and being affected by Ebola even more poor because they can't go and work in So many things have stopped. Should that happen in a northern country, it would be much more difficult to deal with. You still have a sense of solidarity which is very strong in, in those communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you so much, Michel. It's fine, thank you. 
The head of Germany's Bishops' Conference says local bishops support divorced and civilly remarried Catholics receiving communion under certain conditions. Cardinal Reinhard Marx says German bishops favor differentiated solutions to individual cases and under certain conditions support admission to the sacraments. Cardinal Marx has signaled this backing before, but today's statement includes support from the rest of Germany's bishops. Discussions surrounding divorced and remarried Catholics continue ahead of next October's Ordinary Synod of Bishops on the Family. Six people are dead and several others injured in Glasgow, Scotland, after a garbage truck crashed into pedestrians shopping for Christmas. The incident happened in several parts of the city's downtown area. Police say it was an accident and nothing more sinister, but the investigation is still ongoing. Witnesses report the driver became ill and lost control of the truck. More than 100 Spaniards from one Madrid neighborhood hit the jackpot today, part of a $3 billion pot. Spain's Christmas season lottery called El Gordo, or the Fat One, awards prizes to thousands of people instead of just a handful of lucky folks. Today's winners won $490,000 each in the world's richest lottery. Spaniards, Spaniards were glued to their TVs for the four-hour-long drawing before the country's economic problems in recent years. Winners bought new cars or vacation properties. Now many use the winnings to pay off debt. Up next, we hear from the organizers of this year's New York Encounter Conference. Hello, I'm Dr. Alveda King, wishing EWTN News Nightly, the whole EWTN family, and everyone a merry, merry Christmas. I'm the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and I'm standing here before his monument in Washington, D.C. As director of African American Outreach with Priest for Life, I want to say, Merry Christmas to all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on Jesus Christ shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us this Monday evening. I'm Suzanne LaFranchi. It's the final stretch for holiday shipping, and carriers say they're doing everything possible to get packages delivered on time. UPS says this is their busiest day of the year and added around 90,000 seasonal workers to meet demand. FedEx added some 50,000 employees for the rush last Monday was their major shipping day. Last year, a winter storm and high demand delayed some customer shipments from arriving in time for Christmas. The post office in Rudolph, Wisconsin, has a nose for capitalizing on its festive name, especially this time of the year. Catherine Elliott has more. He's the most famous reindeer of all. And how do reindeer love And he's particularly loved in this central Wisconsin village of under 500 people that shares his name. More than 10,000 letters pass through the post office in December for the special postmark. If they can't physically drive here, we get cards and boxes and um, envelopes from all over the country. We even had one from China. The cards start arriving in the spring, and the postmaster holds them until December. Then they use an old-fashioned machine for the postmarks. It, it just it inks each letter individually, but it feeds them through a series of rollers and quite a unique process. There's also a special Rudolph stamp available in the lobby. You know, when I'm paying a bill that has to be paid in Chicago or someplace that whoever gets that envelope sees that. And I like to think that uh, they, they get a kick out of it. Rudolph the red -nosed reindeer. This year happens to be the 50th anniversary of the Rudolph Christmas special. And the Postal Service offered a commemorative stamp. This year has really been a, a very unusual one and, and we've seen many uh, more people mailing, much more activity um, here in our little post office. Rudolph seems to bring out the Christmas spirit in everyone. This is the only place that I knew of that I could get my kids involved um, in the, the mailing process and um, put the stamp on and um, it have everybody. It was pretty fun. And, yep, it was it pretty was fun. Awesome. <laughs> Rudolph, leaving his mark on a new generation. You go down in history. Catherine Elliott, EWTN News Nightly. 
Pope Francis received nearly 8,000 members of a community dedicated to the poor and marginalized on Saturday, the Pope St. John the 23rd Community. Now recognized in, as an association of lay faithful, the community was founded in the 1960s by Father or Orteze Benzi on his experience with young people. The foundation's work involves offering teens who have drifted away from the church a chance to live in the image of Christ. The community requires a space for prayer and living the life of the poor, being led by obedience and practicing fellowship according to the gospel. Thousands of Catholics will meet in New York next month to define their identity in our ever-changing culture. New York Encounter is an annual three-day cultural festival which started in 2010. The event is organized by members of the Communion and Liberation Catholic Movement. We are joined now by Suzanne Tanzi and Vitaly Kuzmin, both organizers at this upcoming New York Encounter conference. First of all, how do you define the Communion and Liberation Movement? Well, the Communion and Liberation Movement started with the Servant of God, Father Luigi Giussani, who right after finishing seminary, he changed from being a teacher in the seminary to being a high school teacher in a public school of religion. Mm -hmm. And he did that because he saw how much the youth, while they did have faith in the 1950s, they didn't really have a grasp of the reasonableness of faith and didn't really understand how much faith had to do with life. And so ever since then, the movement, Communion Liberation, was born out of the main idea that Christ is a living presence, mm -hmm. and through this living presence, we experience a fulfillment and a joy in life. And so faith is reasonable. And it, it is so true. Um, I have three teenagers, and, and, and it's really, it, I think it's important to bring it alive. Mm -hmm. um, how do the three popes, the latest three popes, how are they incorporated in this, Suzanne? Well, the mission statement of New York Encounter is, um, it begins with one of the main pillars of the church as well, which is that we build a civilization of truth and love. And that's the starting point. The other, uh, which of course comes from John Paul II. And from there, you see the fruit of how the intelligence of the faith becomes intelligence of reality. And you see how faith can impact on culture. Can you that's give from, us an example of that? Yes, <laughs> that's from Benedict, by the way. Um, well, faith impacting on culture is seen pretty much in our everyday lives. You know, how we interact at work, how we interact on our jobs, the kind of art that we um, make and share, the literature, um, anything you can imagine, the, the faith has a way of informing that. And we're, uh, Community Liberation is, is a group that hopes to live that out in the public square. So, so the, we should live like Christ. Yes, but together in fraternity and, and also inclusive, like uh, Pope Francis has said, going out to the periphery, um, the fact that the New York encounter is in the public square dead center in Manhattan is not a coincidence. It's a, it's a welcome for all. I think we'll get 4,000 people and guarantee they're not all Christians or Catholics, but they're um, seekers. That's great outreach. How did you choose the theme, the human face? Uh, well, I think that identity is a perennial theme. Um, meaning in life is not anything new from, you know, centuries. But right now, the technology and the fast pace of our culture is, is picking up. Uh, I think it's probably introducing a lot of confusion and a lot of desire for meaning that um, is something that attracted the organizers of New York Encounter to the point that, you know, we look at the fact that there's 52 ways to identify yourself on Facebook. There's now 84 genders. Um, people are looking for some roots and some sense, and this is something open to all. I'm not saying we have the answers, but it's a place to start. And and um, the volunteers are incredible. Mm -hmm. You have like 10 percent. I mean, you have 4,000 participants and 300 volunteers. That's incredible. Yeah, no. In fact, that's that's one of the most unique experiences. Is this is a totally free cultural event, and it's year-round organized by people who are not paid. So going from the five or six uh, people year-round who plan the event to the 300 volunteers going from high school age all the way to adults and people with families, etc. Um, they're, they're essential for the experience of the New York Encounter. And God bless them for it. Suzanne Tanzi and Vitaly Kuzman, thank you so much and have a Merry Christmas. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming Merry in Christmas. this busy time of year. Appreciate thank it so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Finally tonight, uh, we might think of eggnog. Well, we're not going to do that story. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and watch again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Suzanne LaFranchi. Thanks for watching tonight. Good night and God bless.